Today, we welcome to the program John Kiriakou, former CIA counterterrorism officer turned whistleblower who has some very interesting things to say about pardons that may or may not have been offered by a former lawyer to a former president. But but we will get to that. John, really great having you on. I appreciate your time. Oh, thanks so much for the invitation. Happy to do it. So to give the audience some context to start with, uh, you were a CIA officer in 2007, six years after 9-11. Uh, you blew the whistle on what was effectively torture that was being used by the CIA. You were, I believe, the first federal government employee to do so. You were not ultimately prosecuted for disclosing that, but I'll, I'll give you the opportunity to weigh in. Maybe for political reasons, you were not prosecuted for that, but ultimately, uh, you, I believe you say as retaliation, you were prosecuted. Talk to us about what you knew, your involvement, why you decided to blow the whistle to start with. It's actually quite a long story that I'm going to make very, very short. Uh, I was uh, I was a senior CIA counterterrorism officer after 9-11. I was the, the chief of CIA counterterrorism operations in Pakistan. I led a series of raids there that resulted in the uh, capture of Abu Zubaydah, who we believed at the time was the number three. Abu Zubaydah was also the first person um, captured by the CIA who had been ranked internally as a high value target. And because he was the first, he was also the first to undergo uh, torture, what the CIA at the time was calling enhanced interrogation techniques. Uh, I objected to that. I thought it was torture. I thought it was illegal. I still think it's illegal, besides being immoral and uh, and unethical. And um, and my objections were uh, overridden and ignored. I left the CIA in 2004. I formally resigned in 2005 and waited for somebody to come out and say something about this program. It was just so patently illegal to me. I thought certainly somebody will come out and say something. Nobody did. And so then in December of 2007, in response to a request from, from Brian Ross at ABC News, I said something. I went on a nationally televised uh, uh, show and I said that the CIA was torturing its prisoners. I said that torture was official US government policy. And I said that the policy had been personally approved by the president himself. As you might imagine, the CIA reported me to the FBI for leaking classified information, and the FBI investigated me from the very next day, December of 2007, until December of 2008. Uh, after that year-long investigation, the FBI sent my attorneys what's called a declination letter, declining to prosecute me. They said that the information was not classified, that it was already out there, it had been published by Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and the International Committee of the Red Cross, and they dropped the case. I did not know that three weeks later, when Barack Obama became president, and John Brennan, an old nemesis of mine, became the deputy national security advisor, that Brennan asked the Justice Department to secretly reopen the case against me. And so they investigated me for another three years, and then in uh, January of 2012, I was arrested and charged with five felonies coming out of that ABC News interview, three counts of espionage, one count of violating the Intelligence Identities Protection Act of 1982, and one count of making a false statement. We were never really clear as to what the false statement was supposed to have been. That charge was dropped. I absolutely did not commit espionage, and those charges were dropped. But uh, they got me on a technicality. Uh, I had confirmed the surname of a former colleague of mine to a journalist who wanted to interview him for a book. And that was the, the crime that they got me on. That name was never made public. And other senior CIA officers who had done the same thing, like David Petraeus, for example, who revealed the names of, of 10 covert operatives to his adulterous girlfriend, uh, was never prosecuted. But you know, I always maintain that I was prosecuted for political reasons, and I'm a big boy. I know how Washington works, and that was that was 
a calculation that John Brennan and the Justice Department made to silence someone who had opposed the torture program. They didn't silence me. They actually empowered me. And uh, here we are now all these years later. So, so many different things to ask about with regard to the techniques that were being used mm -hmm. that you blew the whistle on. You talked about there were apparently discussions about the legality and ethics and whether these techniques, the use of the techniques is policy. Was there ever a discussion about their effectiveness and whether, listen, if we do this stuff, they or in most cases, he are just going to tell us what what he thinks he needs to say in order to get us to stop? Was that ever discussed? Right. Right. That's a great question. Um, and the answer is uh, no, not not in any meaningful depth. Huh. You know, in the, in the immediate aftermath of, of 9-11, I, I think this is something that most people don't have a full appreciation for. There was at least as much a desire for revenge as there was for information to uh, to disrupt future attacks. Uh. So, you know, those those very senior officers, those CIA leaders who had conceived of the torture program, had implemented the torture program and then briefed it to the oversight committees on Capitol Hill. Um, they didn't care if the prisoner was going to tell us what he thought we wanted to hear. They figured we would collect everything that the prisoner said and then turn it over to the analysts and right. let the analysts sort through it. So is there going to be actionable intelligence in there? Sure, there is. Is there going to be garbage? There's going to be a lot more garbage than there is actionable intelligence. But you're able then to sate that desire for revenge and collect intelligence at the same time. So it wasn't that, that, that it, it wasn't that it wasn't discussed because people didn't necessarily believe we might get nonsense from doing this. It was just that it didn't matter and we'll kind of sort through it in the aftermath. Yeah, that's exactly it. When it that's comes exactly to it. the locations where some of these things were taking place, colloquially sometimes known as these black sites, yes. to the extent you can talk about it, the CIA employees that are involved in servicing these sites, either directly participating in the in the torture or not. Right. Because these are locations that presumably need ancillary services of different kinds. Are Correct. they typically in these countries, their entire presence in the countries? Is it illegal? Is it under diplomatic cover or do they have some nominal other job while there? That's that's a tough one to answer without getting in trouble uh, there. The, the CIA uses a, a multitude of covers, both official and unofficial. This would have been official cover. Uh, in most cases, it was done with the acquiescence of the host government. Ah. Um, and it wasn't deep cover. It wasn't backstopped in any way. So if if somebody if you're sitting next to somebody on a plane, they say, what do you, what do, you do for a living? You say, oh, I work for the Department of Commerce. I work for the State Department. Oh, what do you do at the State Department? Oh, I'm involved in uh, in international trade. You know, that's so boring that nine times out of 10, nobody's going to ask you a follow up question. Right. But now if they call the State Department and ask, can you know, can I talk to John Kiriakou? There, there is no John Kiriakou there that's going to answer the phone so that it's not backstopped in that way where Got they have people at headquarters covering for you. Um, now, with that said, um, I, I've said this publicly in the past, and, and we know it's true thanks to the Senate torch report. Uh, there were many cases in many of these various countries where black sites existed, where the president or the prime minister of those countries had no idea that these torture chambers were, were there right. in their territory. These were handshake deals between George Tenet, the head of the CIA, and the head of whatever that host intelligence service was. That's how secret this was. And you you said something also that that I think bears repeating because it's true. Uh, very few, very, very few CIA officers were actually physically involved in the torture program. Right. But there were large support staffs, you know, everybody from secretaries to analysts to doctors and nurses um, to communications professionals. They were all there to support the actual torturers. Is there sometimes in fictionalized accounts of these situations, 
there's a tension portrayed between the torturers and the doctors yes. where the doctors say you're 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 going too far. And the torturers say, you know, the, the bomb is ticking. We've got it. And, and it's portrayed in this kind of dramatic way. Is is that in any way an accurate representation of how these things go? Yes, actually. Uh, you know, I remember in in the very, very earliest days after the CIA started torturing Abu Zubaydah, uh, like the first week or the first two weeks, there were there were cables coming back being written by the doctors saying, hey, wait a minute, I didn't sign up for this. This is a violation of the Hippocratic Oath. Mm. I want to come home. That's called the curtailment cable where you want to curtail your current assignment and come home. That's usually a career ending decision. Mm. You're never going to get promoted again if you curtail. But you've got this ethical dilemma. You put your hand in the air and you swore to first do no harm. And now your job is to allow these guys to torture a prisoner to within an inch of his life. And then if they go too far and his heart stops, your job is to bring him back to life so he can be tortured more. Mm. One of the great disappointments for me in those early days was that even though doctors objected, most of them didn't do anything about it. They didn't come home. Uh, they didn't file lawsuits. They didn't go to the inspector general and file a complaint. They just maintained their silence. Hmm. Did this stuff literally make it difficult to sleep at night? Yes. And not just for me, but for a lot of people. You know, I remember people coming back from the secret sites and crying. Uh, they, they suffered from PTSD. They had to take time off work. People went on anti-anxiety medication. It, this was just an all around bad idea. Now, with that said, the CIA is full of sociopaths mm. and psychopaths who slept just fine at night. Mm. So let's talk about the uh, pardon. You served your sentence. Um, you were not going to be entitled to your CIA retirement benefits as a result of the prosecution and the sentence. And right. you um, tell the story of a meeting with Rudy Giuliani with the possibility of paying two million dollars for Trump to pardon you. Is that, are, are those the top line details as, as we understand them? Yes, indeed. How did this for now, just to put up front, even financial, if you were willing to do it, the two million didn't make sense because it seems like the retirement yeah. benefits were worth about 700 K. Is that right? OK, that's right. So the math didn't make sense. How did this first come to your attention that this was maybe something that could happen? I uh, I had worked hard to try to get myself in front of Donald Trump to ask him directly to pardon me. Mm -hmm. My pitch was Barack Obama ruined my life and you're the only person that can give it back to me. Uh, an appeal to his ego. Exactly. Yeah. OK. So I, I had a supporter in uh, in Tucker Carlson and Tucker invited me on the show a dozen times over the course of the Trump presidency and a dozen times. I went on and listen, you know, I'm a third generation Democrat. I'm decidedly left of center, but I hate Barack Obama. And that is what uh, that's what Tucker Carlson wanted to hear. And mm -hmm. I was perfectly happy to say it. So uh, Trump saw me on on Tucker's show one one night and told uh, Jared Kushner to get in touch with me. So. Uh, his lawyer called my lawyer and we met uh, briefly at his lawyer's office. And uh, to make a long story short, he was not helpful, not helpful at all and not even nice about it. So I mentioned to a friend of mine, I need to get to Trump and this Kushner thing didn't work. What should I do? And he said, you need to get to Rudy Giuliani. Mm -hmm. I said, actually, I know a guy who knows a guy who can get me in front of Rudy. So I called my friend. I said, hey, can you put me in front of Rudy Giuliani? He said, sure, I'll make a call. So I talked to Giuliani's uh, assistant or deputy or major domo or whatever it was that he was calling himself. And he said, actually, we're going to be in Washington next week. Why don't we meet at the Trump Hotel? I said, great. Naturally. Yeah, that's the only place he would ever meet with people. <laughs> so I went to the Trump Hotel. And, uh, you know, the funny thing is that I normally work from uh, I have a live radio show from 12 to 2. So I said, well, how about any time after two o'clock? He said, no, 
uh, Rudy uh, likes to, uh, you know, enjoy the day. And usually by two o'clock, he's not able to do business. I just have to do this. It's like in a court for people only listening. John did the drinky, drinky hand gesture when he said that we just need to, for what it is. That's what he did. <laughs> so I said, OK, that's fine. We met at 11 o'clock. And uh, we're all sitting there just making small talk, just meaningless chit chat. Yeah. And finally, I said, so, Mr. Mayor, there's this issue of, of a pardon I wanted to raise with you. And he said, anybody know where the pisser is? And he got up and just walked away. And I said to his assistant, what the heck just happened? He wants you to go in there, right? I, I, I was happy to follow him in there <laughs> if that's what he wanted. But his, his assistant said, um, you don't talk to Rudy uh, directly about a part. Oh. You talk to me and I talk to Rudy. I gotcha. said, OK, whatever. And he says, Rudy's going to want two million for the pardon. And I laughed and I said, listen, I don't have two million dollars. I'll never have two million dollars. But even if I did, I wouldn't spend two million dollars to recover a seven hundred thousand dollar pension. Right. So we just sat there for a minute and looked at each other. And I said, this this just isn't going to work. Thank you right. for your time. Giuliani was walking back. I said, Mr. Mayor, thank you for your time. I walked out. Um, I happened to go to a book uh, event that night. A buddy of mine had just come out with a book and there was this big uh, launch party. And I ran into another friend, another whistleblower. He said to me very innocently, how was your day today? And I said, oh, listen to this. And I told him the story that I just told you. He was so enraged <laughs> that on his own volition, he called the FBI and told them that Giuliani had solicited $2 million to sell me a pardon. I didn't know that, but the FBI never called me. And my friend was then so outraged that the FBI never called that he called the New York Times and leaked it to the New York Times. So the New York Times did call. And I decided, you know what? This was an illegal act. It was a felony that Giuliani had committed. And so I'm going to I'm going to tell the New York Times what happened. And I did. As it turned out, Giuliani had done this with several people. Mm. But again, the FBI wasn't interested. I've never spoken to the FBI. They've never called me. They've never questioned me. Um, it wasn't until Giuliani was the subject of a of a civil suit recently yeah. that this came up where the the plaintiff is alleging that in the course of pillow talk, I suppose, um, he told her that he was soliciting $2 million for pardons and he was splitting the money with Donald Trump. I have no idea if that's true. Let me ask you a super practical, like logistical question. If you had wanted to go forward with this, do you have an assumption about how the money would be transferred? Is it like you bring physical cash that you get from somewhere? How would they even do it? You know, I can't imagine that any legitimate bank would even let you have two million. <laughs> even if I had two million dollars in my checking account. Yeah, they they banks normally don't even keep more than ten thousand dollars on hand at any given time. Uh, you have to actually order it from the Federal Reserve. Right. And they and they truck it over it. Plus, there are money laundering laws <clears throat> where you have to report to the IRS any transaction over ten thousand dollars. Right. So my guess is that it would have to be electronic, in which case it would have raised red flags, in which case it would have probably initiated uh, an investigation. And they just couldn't have gotten away with something like that. Yeah, that I mean, of course, it raises the question how many other people were offered this deal, how many took it. And I guess yeah. we don't know, but you would think that there would be some trail if that's if, right, if this was being done regularly in some way. Obviously, we don't know the answer. You know, I'll, I'll add one thing and I, I apologize because I know we're running short up on time. But in a completely unrelated case, my attorney and I went to see an FBI agent over over a case of fraud that I just sort of stumbled over. Mm. And I, I felt it was my duty to report this, this fraud. So I took a thumb drive with me with thousands of pages of supporting documents. And we went to the Washington field office to speak to the FBI. I'm five minutes into my explanation of what we're doing there. And this FBI agent puts up his hands and he says, buddy, if this doesn't have the word terrorism associated mm. with it, we're not interested. And I think that's what happened with Giuliani. Interesting. Yeah. And that rings true to all of my friends who are in some way involved in federal law enforcement have expressed their 
is a compartmentalization of mm -hmm. focus. Mm -hmm. And if something isn't within your immediate purview, very similar attitudes have been seen, I guess, is the point. So that rings that rings very, very true. Yeah, I think that's it. We have been speaking with John Kiriakou, former CIA counterterrorism officer. Um, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. This was fun.